Hello my dear friends, I welcome you all to our channel Best Note Tutorials and today we are going to do MCQs on very important writer and playwright William Shakespeare. This is part 2 and uh, in part 1 we have already discussed few of the MCQs. Before going towards today's uh, video, let me tell you we have prepared PDF on all the writers. If you require that, just drop a message in our channel. Let's begin with today's class. Question number one. By modern critical convention, all is well that ends well is listed among Shakespeare's so-called problem plays. Which other three plays of the bards are traditionally lumped together with all is well in this category? Your options are option A, as you like it, Richard II and uh, Twelfth Night. Option B, Titus Andronicus, The Taming of the Screw and uh, Henry V. Option C, Macbeth, Othello and Coriolanus. Option D, Hamlet, Measure for Measure and Torellus and Cressida. So here your answer is option D, that is Hamlet, Major for Major and Troilus and Cressida. Let's see the highlighters. Problem play was a term invented by the distinguished 19th century scholar F. S. Boas and is notoriously hard or hard to define accurately. Not that this has noticeably affected its general popularity in academic circles. Different critics have interpreted the phrase in a different variety of ways with pretty confusing results. To refer to all is well, as the late Professor Frank Kermode once did, as a Jacobian problem comedy, sounds impressive in a vague sort of way, but so far as I know, he never explained exactly what he meant by it. Having mocked Professor Boas, the original author of the problem play tag for his terminological inexactitude, the 12th century critic Ernest Scanzer rather amusingly then republished a lengthy work entitled The Problem Plays of Shakespeare in which he almost completely ignored all is well that ends well. Trellis and Cressida and Hamlet and instead devoted himself to long and searching chapters on the particular problems he found in Major for Major, Julius Caesar and Antony and Leoptra, one in the eye for the critical consensus there. Friends, we are going to do in-depth discussion, so you have to be patient. Friends, we are discussing in details about the works of William Shakespeare. Therefore, you have to be very patient. Okay, let's move to question number two. Apart from problem play, who else has all, all's well that ends well most often been categorized by critics? Option A, pastoral comedy. Option B, late romance. Option C, historical comedy. And option D, dark comedy. So here... It is categorized by critics into dark comedy. Let's see the highlighters. Dark comedy may not sound like everyone's idea of fun, but the genre offers perhaps a special appeal of its own. It seems to have been more satisfactory, satisfactorily defined than problem play. The critic D.A. Traversy lucidly characterizes play such as all is well that ends well and major for major as comedies in the formal sense but conceived in a spirit almost entirely opposed to that of Shakespeare's early comedies and indeed of comedy in general. Their happy endings tend to ambiguous while the future well-being of the heroes 
and heroines apparently hang by a thread. One could argue that this makes dark comedies potentially more interesting than the more conventional kind of theatrical comedy. Traversi herself, however, like many other critics before and after him, is dismissive of All is Well, relegating it to the status of a preliminary sketch for some aspect, not always the important, not always the most important of major for major. This seems very harsh and other commentators have been more complimentary about All is Well, All is Well's merits as they perceived them. Andrew Dickinson, for example, has praised the special intensity and charm of this neglected play. Question number three. William Shakespeare found his basic plot for All is Well That Ends Well in a book by William Painter called Palace of Pleasure, which was published in the year 1566, which also supplied the playwright with material for other works, including Romeo and Juliet, which Italian Renaissance humanist provided the original for Painter's, Painter's English translation. Your options are Giordano Bruno, Francesco Petrarca, Niccolo Machiavelli, and option D, Giovanni Boccaccio. So here, your correct option is Giovanni Boccaccio. Giovanni Boccaccio is the Italian Renaissance humanist who provided the original for Pinter's English translation. Let's see the highlighters. Pinter translated just 16 of the 100 stories, including in Boccaccio's Decameron, and uh, many of the juiciest and bawdiest tales were not included in the English version. In spite of this apparent drawback, of its readability. However, some scholars believe that Painter's book probably ranked among Shakespeare's favorite reading material, although this is somewhat speculative. To the plot as he found it in Painter, the playwright added four memorable characters of its own, the Countess, Lafew, Parole, and Levarge, the clown, they integrated them expertly into the plot. Let's move to question number four. In which European country or countries does the action of all is well that ends well take place? Option A. France and Italy. Option B. England and Italy. Option C. England and France. And option D. Only in France. So here... Your correct option is option A, that is France and Italy. Let's read out the highlighters. The play opens in Rosillon, in French Rosillon, a medieval region of France. The action then moves on to France, French court in Paris before three of the chief protagonists head off for Italy where the Florentine wars are taking place. The somewhat enchanted air of Italy and the fairy tale romance elements in some of the episodes that take place there will speed on the eventual ingenious resolution of this play as everyone meets up again in Rosillon for the final scene. A certain dove tailing of fairy tale devices and realistic passions is one of the hallmark of all is well, and this is a feature which, as Ernest Scanzer remarked, connected the drama more closely to Cambeline than to anything else in Shakespeare's canon. Shakespearean canon. Another possibly related feature is the presence, first noted by Coleridge, of two distinct, two distinct literary styles in the play, passages of conventional heroic couplets being juxtaposed with others of passionate and high-flown blank verse, a duality which has sometimes led to 
mutterings about shared authorship authorship sorry or alternatively of a, of an incomplete partially botched rewriting by the bard of one of his own early plays the mysterious and still inexplicably missing loves lovers one for example here perhaps lies the true problem of this play it is also possible that shakespeare further revised what f e halliday once called his recalcitrant play during the years of retirement of stratford upon avon certainly the text as we have it contains some particularly beautiful examples of what we usually think of as the late shakespearean blank verse style question number 5 how are the characters dressed in the play's first scene option a all in white option b mostly in white but helena in black option c mostly in black but helena in white option d all in black so here your answer is all in black the characters were dressed in black color cloak in the first scene of the play highlighter says the characters including the play's heroine helena who is later revealed to have something quite different on her mind from that she appears to have are in mourning for the recently deceased count of rosilion while more gloom is added to the scene by references to helena's late father a brilliant physician the critic barbara evet observes that the four figures in black makes a strangely somber opening tableau for a comedy and although shakespeare had attempted something not entirely dissimilar before in twelfth night the clouding of the atmosphere somehow seems more persuasive in this later plays opening scene question number 6 what is helena's first line in all is well that ends well option a a little more than kin and less than kind option b what a piece of work is a man option c there is a willow grows in slant a brook option d i do affect a sorrow indeed but i have it too so here option d is correct that is I do affect a sorrow indeed but I have it too. Highlighter says Helena's silent brooding presence in the play's first scene and the cryptic one liner she utters when finally induced to break her silence are both calculated to arouse the audience interest in her as a character. And as the drama progresses our scene is heightened of a young woman who is not like shakespeare's earlier comic heroine all surface she has depth we often cannot tell what she is thinking or why she says the things she says this play or at least the greater part of it may well have been written immediately after hamlet the year the years 1602 and 1606 are tentatively assigned to its composition although there is no external evidence and other dates have also been suggested of helena's first line one of all's well 20th century editors barbara evet commented perceptively that when uttered this remark like much that she says in the first scene is enigmatic and rad- riddling which makes helena's first appearance in the play curiously like hamlet's in his ma- hamlet's in his question number 7 which one of these statement is true of helena in all is well that ends well option a she is of noble birth 
Option B, she is given several soliloquies during the course of the play. Option C, she is followed everywhere by the clone. Option D, she is treated badly by countess. So here option B is correct that is she is given several soliloquies give, during the course of the play. The troubled heroine's first soliloquy in which she opens her heart passionately, if not perhaps completely, to the audience after evidently having felt constricted by the presence on a stage of the other characters begins arrestingly. Oh, were that all, I think not on my father, and these great tears grace his remembrance more, remembrance more than those I shed for him. What was he like? I have forgot him. Her second soliloquy at the end of the scene is, like much of the verse in the first half of the play, written in heroic couplets, as if belonging to an earlier period of Shakespeare's career. Nevertheless, it too begins quite forcefully. Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven. The action of the play, as it develops, serves to demonstrate how completely Helena has taken this maxim to heart. When she soliloquies later on, she sometimes takes on a more choric role, summarizing the action in which she herself is playing a part. Question number eight. In line with the general neglect suffered by all is well that ends well during the 17th century, which one of these statements is true of the song performed on stage by Lavage, the clone for his mistress, the countess? Option A. The original music by Thomas Morley had survived. Option B. No original music for it had survived. Option C. The original music for it by Robert Johnson has survived. Option D. The original music for it by an unknown hand had survived. Here your option B is correct. No original music for it has survived. The Rapscallion of a Clown Clone, sorry. A stock dramatic example of the witty servant who punctures the pretensions of his sophisticated betters adds spice to many of the scenes involving the countess whom he follows around like a malevolent shadow. There seems unfortunately little to be said in praise of his song, possibly the least inspired in the whole of Shakespeare. Given that the, the conversation during this scene is about the play's heroine, Helena, the clone takes it upon himself to perform a doleful number, apparently corrupting a popular ditty of Shakespeare's own time, which refers obliquely to Helen of Troy. It is not known whether the clone sang or merely disclaimed, declaimed this number, but there is an implicit challenge here to latter-day composers, the versatile Sir Peter Maxwell Davies, who died in 1916, would have been ideal to create a suitably nerve-rackling musical setting in order to divert the audience's attention from the poetry of its text. There was apparently a very funny clone in John Dove's well-received 2011 production of the play at the Restored Globe Theatre on London's Bankside. What is the name of the... <coughs> Question number nine. What is the name of the young lord with whom Helena is in love? Option A, Angelo, Option B, Lysander, Option C, Demetrius, and Option D, Bertram. So here, your answer is Bertram. 
let's see the highlighters i cannot reconcile myself to bertram grumbled samuel johnson with some degree of justice a man noble without generosity and young without truth who sneaks home second marriage is accused by a woman whom he has wronged defends himself by falsehood and is dismissed to happiness in a similar vein george bernard shaw downplays the character as a perfectly ordinary young man whose unimaginative prejudices and selfish conventionality makes him cut a very mean figure he can be seen as a victim too forced by his kings to marry a woman he does not love and is not remotely interested in his initial refusal to bow to the king's command to marry helena although the only reason to give only reason he gives is that his intended bride is a low born commoner has been interpreted by the contemporary british critic andrew dickson as the honest response to a man being forced to play along with someone else's bizarre fairy tale it is a source of the greatest distress of helena that like ophelia in hamlet she loves a man of noble rank out of her star while lamenting the sad fate of those like her we the poorer born whose baser stars do shut up in wishes question number 10 what service does helena perform for the king at the french court option a she saves him from death by warning him of an imminent rebellion option b she tells him a story every evening after dinner option c she takes control of royal household and makes it efficient option d she cures him of his wasting disease so here option d is correct that is she cures him of his wasting disease Helena's late father, an extraordinary gifted magician, bequeathed to her many medical secrets, and having studied these, she decided to leave for the France court, French court, and try to cure the king of his debilitating fistula, which he defies the attempts remedies of all. his other doctors and has left its victim resigned to a low and painful death she is most strongly motivated in her actions however by the prospect of seeing bertram again at court as the fairy tale tradition demands the king is immediately cured by helena's treatment and honors the promise she had previously extracted from him to let her choose a husband from the assembled lord of his court of course she chooses bertram but is cruelly rejected until the king bullies the reluctant bridegroom into going through with an immediate marriage ceremony bertram then absconds absconds from court in order to forget his sorrows by fighting in the florentine wars worse the king had forbidden him for participate him to participate in on the grounds of his tender age question number 11 what action does helena quickly take on hearing of her father's of her husband's flight from the french court option a she follows him to italy option b she retires to a nunnery option c She goes on a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Option D. She waits for him in France in the hope he will change his mind. So here option A is correct. That is 
she follows him to the italy to italy helena receives a letter from bertram in which she reads the sentence till i have no wife i have nothing in france her first thought is to leave france so that bertram may return there without needing to be hampered or clogged by her presence then rather quixotically she writes and sends an impromptu sonnet to the countess expressing her intention to travel to saint jacques shrine at compostela in spain it has appeared to most readers and audiences but one can never be sure with helena that her intention are not primarily religious but that she is in fact chasing bertram and seeking to entrap him in defiance of any moral scruple she may be supposed to be feeling barbara evet suggests that shakespeare is using the romance mode to move the stress from the rational motivation or cause of event on to their fruits or effects adding that the mystery worries few in the theater nevertheless helena's behavior is pursuing bertram to florence and what she does when she gets there involving the nine honored time honored literary device of the bed trick was considered quite shocking by many readers in the 19th century Ernest Scanger however has argued forcefully that what may seem morally perplexing or ambiguous would not have seemed so to an Elizabethan audience Helena's actions conform to the common folk tale motif of the clever wench fulfilling her seemingly impossible task an Elizabethan audience would have felt undivided sympathy and admiration for her Question number twelve: Which of these statements is not true of Bertram in the play? Option A: He is infatuated with a young Florentine woman. Option B: He sends Helena a letter with a riddle in it. Option C: He is tricked into sleeping with Helena. Option D: He never give up, gives up his ring to anybody. So here, option D is correct. He never gives up his ring to anybody. Let's see the highlighters. The riddle Bertram sends Helena before leaving France had something of the flavor of a raw fairy tale. When thou canst get the ring upon my finger, which never shall come off, and show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. Helena is clever enough to fulfill both of these impossible demands by the stock comedic device which Shakespeare had used before in much ado about nothing and was to use again in measure for measure of the bed trick she impersonates young Dinah with whom Bertram is infatuated but who is in fact a fiesty young woman capable of handling her impetuous admirer without any difficulty and thus she helena succeeds both in sleeping with her husband and in persuading him to exchange rings he gives her his valuable family ring it is an honor longing to our house bequeathed down from many ancestors and she is she in return presents him with the equally splendid one she had from the king of france all these intimate action all these intimate actions of course takes place off stage the french lords ruefully reflects on what they believe to be ruining of dinah's virtue this night he flesses his will in the spoil of a humor as the second lord salaciously puts it question number 13 
What is the name of Bertram's flamboyant friend whose name reflects his character and who utters one of the best known lines in the play? A young man married is a man that hard. Option A. Rinaldo. Option B. Angelo. Option C. Parole. And option D. Dumaine. So here option C is correct that is parole. Parole. That jackanapes with the scarves as the Florentine Diana scornfully characterizes him is a great talker but his actions always completely fail to match up to his words. He is finally exposed in Italy as a total coward by a trick engineering by his comrades in arms with Bertram's approval an episode which provides Shakespeare with a glorious opportunity to display his gift for hilarious theatrical comedy. The boitrous realism, realism of this scene helps to distract the audience's attention from the inherent improbability of the bed trick action which is evidently going on at the same time. After having been utterly exposed to all and sundry as an incorrigible coward who would happily betray his nearest and dearest without batting an eyelid, Parole is left briefly to reflect alone on a stage upon his ruined reputation. Question number 14. Which character in the play utters the catchphrase, All is well that ends well, twice as the plot moves towards, the, towards its, its eventual resolution? Option A. Helena. Option B. Diana. Option C. The Countess of Rosalion. Option D. The Widow of Florence. So here, the protagonist Helena utters the title of the play, All is Well That Ends Well. Helena's first use of the catchphrase occurs in a charming couplet to round off a long, long passage of dialogue in blank verse and it is really little better than doggerel. All is well that ends well. Still, the finds the clone. Whatever the course, the end is the renown. Its second occurrence, however, has the strength of echo and is also poetically superior. All is well that ends well, yet, though time seems so adverse and means unfit. Through the long and troubled journeying of Helena back through Marcel's to Rosalion in the company of Diana and her mother, the widow of Florence, these, ab these unobtrusive verbal echoes give a sense of the play's momentum and of the possibility of a final happy outcome of the various strifes and torments of the play's action. They may also sublim subliminally suggest that everything is being driven purely and solely by Helena's willpower and strength of character so that she herself in a way becomes fate and fortune combined in her own person. It is almost as if Helena is taking control of Shakespeare's own pen as she drives the drama on inexorably to the conclusion which she has desired and planned all along. Shakespeare's profound sense of verbal irony may well be present in the play's title, The Sudden Happy Ending, as various critics have noted in Hedged Around with If clauses. But this is balanced by the mo more positive feeling of a dark and wintry story, hesitantly looking forward to a happier season, particularly in the achingly beautiful lines which Shakespeare gives to Helena at the beginning of the long journey which she makes accompanied by her two Italian friends back to Rosalion. The time will bring on summer. When briars shall I have shall have leaves as well as thorns and be as sweet as syrup. Question number fifteen. 
How many characters die during the action of All is well that ends well? Option A 3, Option B 1, Option C none, Option D 2. So here we don't find anyone's death in the play. Therefore it is C which is the answer. Although no one dies during the course of the action, thoughts of death as in Hamlet and Measure for Measure are often presented in the characters' minds. The clone, Levarge, follows his countess around everywhere like a lugubrious ghostly shadow. The recently deceased count and his physician are referred to so often that they seem almost to be participants in the drama. The king too, although the remains relatively active, itself consciously dying a slow and agonizing death until magically cured by Helena. His newfound vigor, however, does not prevent him from remarking shortly before the end of the play that we are old and on our quickest decrease the inaudible and noiseless foot of time stills ever we can affect them. Question number 16. Who speaks the play's epilogue? Option A, Bertram. Option B, the king. Option C, Diana. Option D, Helena. So it is option B, the king. The king speaks play's epilogue. The play's final denouncement is so breathlessly achieved that the king seems to have begun and finished in brief epilogue before the audience has had time to blink. The king's a beggar. Now the stage, the play is done. All is well ended if this suit be worn, that you express content. It is a very conventional ending, but we are left afterwards to dwell on all the human complexities of the drama, which the quick fire finish has effectively, inevitably glossed over. Question number 17. Whose name the author of Women Beware Women and other interesting plays has in the 21st century been put forward in scholarly circles as a possible collaborators with Shakespeare on All is Well That Ends Well? So your options are Thomas Decker, Thomas Nash, Thomas Haywood and Thomas Middleton. So answer is option D, Thomas Middleton. Middleton was in London at the right time, but theories of his supposed collaboration. Question number 18. What nickname was attached to All is Well That Ends Well during the 18th century? Option A. The Unfortunate Comedy. Option B. The Impenetrable Comedy. Option C. The Fairy Tale Comedy. Option D. The endurable comedy. So your answer is the unfortunate comedy. The nickname of All is Well That Ends Well play is the unfortunate comedy. All is Well Ill Fortunate may be said to have begun much earlier when the text of the play published in Post Thomas. First folio of Shakespeare's work was published in 1623. The only surviving early version of All's Well proved to be riddled with various strange errors and inconsistencies. It was, however, a series of theatrical mishaps in 1740s which led to the unfortunate comedy tag. The play's first known performance in England, in London, in 1741 was apparently stemmed by the arrival in town of the illustrious David Garrick demanding of the company that they should switch to better known Shakespearean works. Then the following year when All is Well was staged in the Drury Lane Theatre, the actor playing the king fell ill and died and the run was cancelled. The Unfortunate Comedy is also the title of a book published in 1968 by J.G. Price, which is still, I believe, in the early 20th, 21st century, the only full-length study of All is Well That Ends Well 
ever to have seen the light of day. Price offers a robust defense of the play against its many defectors. Question number 19. Which eminent Irish playwright, intellectual and admirer of Henrik Ibsen, once declared that all is wet that ends well was a play rooted in my deepest affection? Option A. William Butler Yeats. Option B. Bredan Behan. Option C. George Bonnard Shaw. And option D. Scene O. Cassie. So here, J.B. Shaw is the correct answer. Shaw was captivated by the character of Helena, famously comparing her to the intellectuality forward and modern figure of Nora in Ibsen's A Doll's House. The playwright's actress friend, Ellen Terry, however felt otherwise, calling Helena despicable and echoing the traditional Victorian objections to the characters as an immodest and unprincipled manhunter. Neither Shaw nor Terry appear to have given due weight to the fairy tale conventions on which much of the heroine's behave, behavior is based. But it is true that some of her utterances, rich and memorable as they are, can strike a kind of crypto feminist note. O oh, strange men, that can such sweet use make of what they hate when saucy trusting of the cosent thoughts defiles the pitchy night. Question number 20. Which grande dame of British theatre who was born at Croydon, Surrey in 1907 got rave reviews for her playing of the elderly countess of Rosillon in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre production of All is Well That Ends Well or Stratford upon Avon in 1982. Option A. Vivian Leigh. Option B. Judy Dench. Option C. Peggy Ascroft. Option D. Edith, Edith Evans. So here your answer is Peggy Ascroft. Harriet Walter played Helena and Mike Gwilym and uh, Philip Franks both took on the part of Bertram at different times under John Bertram's direction. In spite of the high caliber of the rest of the cast, it was widely felt that Dame Peggy stole the show with her sensitive portrayal of what G.B. Shaw had once called the most beautiful old women's part ever written for the theatre. Friends, by this we have completed part 2 of MCQs from William Shakespeare and uh, we will come up with more videos. Till then, practice all the MCQs every day. Till then, all the best. Thank you.